and amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20, very familiar passage. And it says, go therefore and make disciples out of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. This passage was given to the disciples after Jesus' resurrection and right before he ascended back to heaven. This is one of the most important commands in the Bible, especially as it relates to the mission of the church. It reveals God's purpose for saving us and uniting us together as the body of Christ. Because every person that God saves is supposed to be a disciple of Christ. This mandate is for all true believers, regardless of your role in the church or whether or not you even attend church at a local level. By not attending a local church regularly and faithfully does not absolve you of your God-given responsibility, nor does it let you off the hook. You and I are supposed to be disciples for Christ. And because we're on disciples for Christ, we're all on a mission for Christ. Amen. Wherever God puts you, that is your mission field. Where you live, that is your mission field. Wherever you work, that is your mission field. Wherever you go to school, that is your mission field. Amen. As we turn our attention to this last chapter of Colossians in chapter four, to get a little bit of background. Paul was a prisoner in Rome, but this does not stop him from bearing witness for Christ. Despite his own personal trials, Paul told the Colossian believers how to be effective witnesses for Christ. Colossians is one of Paul's prison letters which means he was held in confinement when he wrote it. Paul went on three missionary journeys, all recorded in the book of Acts, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ all over the known world at that time. From the time Paul met Jesus on that Damascus road, Paul was on a mission to reflect the glory of Christ and tell a dying world about a Savior that loved them and wanted to save them and use them for his glory. So my question to Agape this morning what is your mission? What is your purpose in life? Why do you exist? And what do you live for? Amen? Amen. If we want to tag today's message with a title, we would simply call it the mission driven life. Colossians chapter four, chapter four verse uh, two through six is the text we're coming from this morning. A mission can be defined as a specific task with with which a personal group is charged. In this case, the task was given by God, not man. Therefore, to have a mission-driven life means to allow God to use your life to fulfill his kingdom agenda on this earth. So based on this passage, what are three characteristics of a mission-driven life does the Apostle Paul give us? I'll give you three. Number one, devoted prayer is a characteristic of a mission-driven life. Number two, a wise lifestyle is a characteristic of a mission-driven life. And number three, godly speech is a characteristic of the mission-driven life. To be mission-driven means to be purpose-driven. Because I am a devout Christian, Jesus gives my life purpose, and I am on a mission for him, and I hope you are too. To reach the lost and disciple to save. So let's break down these three points from this text. What are three characteristics of a mission driven life? Does Paul give us in this text? Number one, devoted prayer is a characteristic of the mission driven life. Look at verse two of Colossians four. It said, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. The alert is the Colossians must stay alert for, uh, for false teaching that contradicted the gospel message. Jesus gave his disciples a similar warning prior to his arrest. The way that you stay alert if you know the word of God. Nobody should ever tell you something about the Bible that it doesn't say and you go along with it because you don't catch it. And you don't have a clue or understand that that's not even what that says and that's not even what that meant. So stop saying amen to bad teaching. Amen. Amen. Verse three says, praying at, at 
at the same time for all of us, as well as that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been in prison. Paul said praying this, uh, at the same time. Paul encourages the Colossians to, to partner with him in, in preaching ministry through prayer. Right. In the morning at about 9 a.m., there was those of us who come early enough that we want to pray. We come together to pray specifically for the church, for the community which we sit, for the entire body of Christ, and all the other specific needs that we have. And the reason why we gather collectively together faithfully, and you can join us if you desire to come early, and we hope you do, is because we're praying for the success of today's worship. Because we know this message goes out over the internet and that it would touch lives far beyond 1420 West Everett Parkway is our prayer. When he talks about the mystery of Christ, it refers to God's plan of redemption for creation and humanity. This mystery has been revealed through Jesus Christ and the teaching of the apostles. Paul calls himself a prisoner Paul wants the Colossians to understand that his imprisonment is, is a result of his gospel work and that it demonstrates his love for them. You do realize the only reason why Paul was in prison because he was preaching the gospel. And the enemy thought that if we just lock him up, he shut up. <laughs> but even though they locked him up, he refused to shut up. Because he began to write and what he began to write became scripture. Amen. Amen. Verse four said that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. This first point, devoted prayer. Let me give me an example of devoted prayer. First Kings chapter three. This is Solomon's prayer for guidance. Solomon had just become king uh, in his father's place. Solomon at this time is about 40 years old, but he has no experience of being a king. This is brand new to him. And he watched what his father went through to be the king. And this is what he said. Verse 6 of 1 Kings 3, it said, Then Solomon said, You have shown great faithfulness to your servant David, my father. He's having a prayer. He's talking to God. According as he walked before you in truth, righteousness, and uprightness of heart toward you, and you have reserved for him this great faithfulness that you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is to this day. And now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, and yet I am like a little boy. I do not know how to go out and come in. Oh, did I not tell you he's 40? How does a 40-year-old not know how to go out and come in? What is he talking about? What he's talking about is he's immature when it comes to leading a nation as king. It doesn't mean he don't know how to do anything. He just don't know how to be a king because he ain't never done that before. And God has call, called him to this daunting task that he must fulfill. How inadequate do you feel with the daunting task God has called you? Those of us who are pastors, we realize that we are so insignificant and how it is, how do you want us to lead your people, oh God, and we are just so inadequate. I know I feel that way. Oftentimes. It's a daunting task. But it can only be accomplished through the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And to be led by his spirit. Amen. Amen. This is Solomon's prayer. He says in verse 8, he says, And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people who are too many to be numbered or counted. So give your servant an understanding heart. Look what he asked for. Give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil, for who is capable of judging this great people of yours? It's rhetorical because he said, I can't, only you can. Amen. God answers in verse 10. Now it was in sight, 
in the sight of the Lord that Solomon had asked these things. And God said to him, because you have not asked this thing, that you ask for this thing and not ask for yourself long life. Nor have you asked for riches, nor have you asked for the lives of your enemies. He said, you took over as king, I made you king. You didn't say, Lord, make me rich. You didn't say, Lord, give me victory over my, my enemies. You didn't even ask me to give you a long life. He said, behold, he says, but you have asked for yourself discernment to understand justice. Verse 12, behold, I have done according to your words. Behold, I have given you a wise and discerning heart. Every believer should strive to have a wise and discerning heart. So that there has been no one like you before you, nor shall one like you arise after you. He said, there'll never be another king like you. He said, because you ask for a prayer that I'm willing to bless. Instead of you praying to me selfishly. He said, because you prayed the right prayer. He said, I'm going to honor your prayer. He says, he went on to tell him, I have also given you what you did not ask for, both riches and honor, so that there will not be any among the kings like you all your days. Solomon is considered to be the wisest man to ever live. And if you walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commands as your father David walked, then I will prolong your days. He said, I'm going to give you what you didn't ask for. All you got to do is obey me. No, in the same chapter, Solomon's wisdom was put to the test by two women that were prostitutes. In verse 15 to 28, Solomon is now securely on his throne. How would you like to be able to, when you have a dispute with somebody and you get to go and talk to the president himself? How would you love that? You be able to go to the over office, they usher you in, you get to sit down in, in, in front of the president and whoever you have the, your, the disagreement with, they're with you, and you get to tell your case directly to the president. Wow. These weren't even two good upstanding citizens. Oh, did I tell you they were two prostitutes? Well, let me tell you what brought them before the king. Well, both of them had children, but their children were months apart. And so one prostitute woke up one morning and found her child next to her dead. And when she looked at the child, she said, it ain't my child. And what happened is the other woman who was a prostitute in the house rolled over on her child and killed it. So she went to uh, the other woman's room and got her child, put the dead woman child there, the, the dead child there, and brought the other child back and laid in her bed. And they were going back and forth about this, about who child it is. And so they stood before Solomon, and they say, and one said, this is my child. And they'll say, no, for he is my child. Then Solomon said, who would have thought of this, by the way? Solomon said, go get me a sword. And we're just going to cut the child in half, and, and I'm going to give one of you one half, and, and the other one, and you want heads or tails. Which, which one you want? And guess what happened? The woman who that child really belonged to spoke up and said, no, don't kill my child. If, if she has to raise him, I'd rather he lives and she raises him. But don't let any harm come to him. The other woman was like, just give me my half. Give me my half. <laughs> Solomon said, give the child to that woman that had concern for the child, didn't want any harm. And they said that Solomon, it just amazed Israel with the wisdom. Now, who would have thought of that? That was divinely God wisdom given to him. And as long as Solomon obeyed God, then guess what? Solomon can walk in that kind of wisdom. But we realize Solomon didn't stay there. Solomon allowed all of those women, them foreign women that he married, and God had warned them, and you, when you get older, they're going to turn your heart against me, and that's what happened. In fact, that's what caused God to split the kingdom. 
into two kingdoms. That's what ended up had to be in a northern kingdom, a southern kingdom, because of that. And so, second point. A wise lifestyle is a characteristic of the mission-driven life. He says in verse 5, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, the unsaved. Outsiders mean unsaved. Making the most of every opportunity. Do you realize that God gives me and you opportunities all the time? Everybody that crossed your path is not a child of God. Everybody that crossed your path is not a Christian. Amen. But God gives you opportunities with non-Christians to help reach that unbeliever. Amen. That neighbor you got, you can't stand? Well, they live next door to you for a reason. Not just so they can throw trash in your yard. Not just because of that. They're there so you can speak the truth of God in love to them about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. That family member you can't stand. They're in your family so you can speak the truth of love about Jesus Christ and saving grace. That co-worker you see coming and you turn to go the other way. Well, they're there for a reason. Amen. When, when you uh, have a conflict with somebody, stop standing and arguing with a fool. Amen. And ask God to season your words with grace. So that you don't turn them off from want to follow Jesus Christ because you're a bad example. Conduct yourself with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of opportunity. Wisdom, Paul refers to the practical and transformational wisdom, not intellectual insight. Those who uh, apply such wisdom can reflect God's values and character. Amen. The Bible does say wisdom is the principal thing. So get wisdom. But in all thy getting... Get understanding. Wisdom matters. Amen. Wisdom is when God gives you the ability to apply practically divine information. Did you hear what I just said? Wisdom is the ability that God gives that you can apply divine instruction. Amen. So that's why he says, the proverb writer says in uh, Proverbs around 4, 7, wisdom is the principal thing or main thing, so get wisdom, but in all thy getting, get understanding. Amen? Yeah. Let me give you an example of living wise. An example of a wise lifestyle. This is point number two. Peter and John before the Sanhedrin in Acts 4. Now, the background of what's going on in Acts 4, in the previous chapter, Peter and John are going along, and there's a man who's lame. And that's when Peter looks at him, and he basically, he was telling him that, you know, sim and gold, I have none, but what I have, I give that he get up, in the name of Jesus, get him walk. Now, you thought that that would excited everybody, that somebody who didn't have to be a beggar anymore, that he was actually healed, and he got to go get a job. But because of that, they were called before the religious authorities because they were proclaiming the healing and preaching in the name of Jesus. And this offended the religious establishment. All right. So verse five said the next day, the rulers and, and the elders and the teachers of law met, met in Jerusalem. It said, honest, the high priest was there. And so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander and the others of high priestly family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. They said, by what power or what name did you do this? Referring to the man that was healed. Verse 8 said, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people. When, it's, when, it, when it says Peter being filled with the Holy Spirit, that simply means that what Peter's getting ready to say and what Peter's getting ready to do, God's going to approve of it because he's been led by God's spirit. That's what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it says that Peter, here's what Peter said. If we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are, are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of 
of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Peter just went there. Some of us have been standing, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't even know the man. Verse 11, Jesus is the stone. You builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. When he said become the cornerstone, he's talking about the foundation. Amen. 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 Let me ask you a question. Is Jesus your foundation? If he's not your foundation, you might as well be standing on quicksand. Amen. Because all of the ground is sinking sand. Unless Jesus is your anchor. Amen. It doesn't matter what storms you go through as long as Jesus is your anchor. Can you say my anchor holds? My anchor holds. Amen. Verse 12, he says, salvation is found in no one else. Talking about Jesus Christ. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind, but by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, or some translate say uneducated, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Amen. You shout right there. Well, let me ask you a question. Can anybody tell you've been with Jesus? Is there anything about your walk, your talk, the way you live that says that I've been with Jesus? Or when people see you, and the first thing they say, you've been at that juke joint up the street, haven't you? <laughs> you you've been over there at the club again, haven't you? You've been over there drinking that new wine over there they got over there. That's where you've been. I, I can tell. Is that what people say about you? Or they know that people know you, that they know that you are a solid Christian, you are a faithful believer. They know where to find you on Sunday morning. Amen. When they saw the courage, you realize it took courage for them to stand in front of them and tell them that? They could have had these two men killed. They were unschooled. You know when it said unschooled? Well, they were schooled. Who schooled them? Jesus did. What they say with unschooled, they didn't go to the, you know, the religious institutions we went through. <laughs> they didn't go to our Bible college. <laughs> so uh, they, they're uneducated, ca basically calling them stupid men. But one thing they could tell, that they've been with Jesus. That's why it's living. That's why it's living. When someone can look at you and say there's something different about you, when your coworker or classmates or neighbors can say there's something different about you, before you ever tell them I attend a Gothic Community Fellowship Church, they say, I know I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. Anybody ever tell you that? <laughs> you need to work harder if they're not telling you that. You need to live a little more holy life, maybe they'll tell you that. But, but people who don't know you well, but they're getting to know you, and they learn about your walk. And they don't just see the things you do. They pay attention to things you don't do. They don't just hear what you say. But they move by the things you don't say. Amen. Because when everybody else is mad and angry and going off. You sit there and hold your peace. Or they know to find you at your desk praying. Find you in the break room praying. They find you out in your car praying. Because you just refuse to give in to that situation and act like them. Amen? The third point is godly speech is a characteristic of the mission-driven life. Verse 5, once again, he said, conduct yourself with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of your opportunity. Verse 6 says, let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Now he's talking about, see, you and I have to watch how we, what we say to people. Because you can turn people off forever want a relationship with Jesus. Because you can be such a bad example. And they, and they say, if that's what church does for you, I don't want to go to your church. In fact, I don't want to go to church at all. 
Because it don't seem to be helping you any at all. Seen with salt is an ancient, in the ancient world, salt was used to preserve food and enhance flavor. Conversation that is frequently seasoned with salt is uplifting, is what he's talking about. Finally, let me give you an example of godly speech. Joseph returns to Egypt after burying his father, Jacob. After, after he, Joseph, had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt. He and his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. You got to understand the background of this. Jacob had died. Remember, Joseph, the whole reason why Joseph ended up down in Egypt was because his brothers sold him into slavery. And because God had had a plan in order to save all of Israel, which is why God allowed him to be sold as a slave. At the time, he's only about 17 years old. 13 years later, he goes, he goes into the service of Pharaoh at 30. And because of the divine wisdom God had given him, Pharaoh makes him second in command. And so you have the seven year, you have seven years of prosperity and seven years of famine. And so under Joseph's direction, he told Pharaoh, hey, you need to store all this grain up. You need to store, store all this food up. Why things are good. He said, because after these seven years of abundance, it's going to be seven ye lean years. And God put Joseph in charge of all that. And that's when his brothers began to come down. But remember, in his dream, he told them when they put him in the hole in the ground, what led them in, he put him in the hole in the ground before they sold him to Savior, is because he told them that one day y'all gonna bow down to me. That's like your kid telling you, you know, one day you're gonna bow down to me. What would you do? <laughs> that little arrogant child of mine. Your, your siblings say, you, one day you're going to bow down to me. But it came true. Because they did bow down to him. Now, when they come back from burying, because they went all the way back. They didn't bury him in Egypt, down in Goshen where they were. They went all the way back to what was known as the promised land, where they were from, the Jerusalem area, to bury their father. Now, verse 15, watch this. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they felt that the only reason why he didn't retaliate against us because our father was still alive. Now, Joseph had already forgiven them. However, when you sin against people like this, your guilt will never let you off the hook. That's why you stop sinning against people, doing evil things to them. Amen? By the way, they've both been Christians, by the way. And they did what they did. So when Joseph's brothers saw that the father was dead, they said, what if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong we did to him? So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father charged before he died, saying, thus sh uh, shall say to Joseph, please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin for, their, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of, of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Why did Joseph weep? Why was he weeping when they told him that? Again, they, he had already forgiven them. All right. Now, there's no recorded record where Joseph, they had that conversation with Jacob. About that, how he should forgive them. Now, whether that's made up or not, we don't know. What we do know is the fact that Joseph had already forgiven them. It's like when, 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 when someone has been evil to you or done you dirty and you have forgiven them and you never took an opportunity to vengeance or any of that and you're still nice to them but they don't know how to accept it. And even though you've forgiven them, they still wonder whether or not you did forgive them. That's where they're stuck. That's why he's weeping. He said, look, I told you I was going to take care of you. But look, look how he puts it. Watch this. It says that 
His brothers came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for I am I in God's place. Wow. I think you and I need to learn from that. Stop trying to play God in your situation in your life. Amen. Joseph looked at them and said, look, I'm not in God's place. He went further than that. Watch what he says. He says, as for you, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result. Preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Wise speech. Seasoned with salt. Joseph had every right to be angry with his brothers for the rest of his life. He ended up, as a young boy, being sold as a slave, as a free man. How would you like somebody to take you and uh, sell you into slavery? He ends up in Pontiff's house. But as Joseph's life began to take a, a nosedive, it said, but God was with Joseph. Over and over again, the text kept saying, even after every bad thing was mentioned, that means God was signing off on it. To the point that Pontiff's wife came at him on many occasions trying to talk him into sleeping with her. And he, and he denied it doing it. How can I be such a man of God and, and, and give in to that? I cannot. She got so upset with him. One day he was in the house and she grabbed at him and took his coat and he ran out. And she made up a story and told her husband that when Pontifer came back that he tried to rape me. He went to jail for that. For more than two years he went to a jail. When he got down into the jail, God gave me favor there too. Because there he meets a cupbearer and a baker. And God gave him divine favor in the jail and put him in charge. Just like he was in charge in Pontiff's house. Everywhere he went, God was still, the divine favor was still on him. But he refused to act like the Egyptians. The unsaved world around him. And he ended up staying there. And God did that to put him next to the cupbearer. Uh, uh, and the baker, the baker's head was taken off, by the way. The cupbearer was restored to his position. If you want to take out a king, you poison him. That's why you had a cupbearer. I don't think y'all would sign up for a job saying I want to be the cupbearer for a king. An interesting thing about the text is this. The fact that Joseph could have been boiling over with anger. Boy, wait till I see them again. Boy, I'm going to hook them up. I'm going to slap them. I'm going to kick them. I'm going to send my army after them. I'm going to do something. That's what you and I do. Because we allow all that anger and, and, and bitterness to fester. And by the time we see the person, they forgot all about it. But we're still holding all that anger <laughs> and all that bitterness. He said to them, look here. What y'all meant for evil, God meant it for my good to bring about this present result. He said, I ain't mad at you. He said, because I wouldn't be the man of God I am today if it weren't for y'all. If it weren't for what y'all did, I wouldn't be where I am today. Sometimes you got to look at your enemy and say, thank you. Amen. Sometimes you got to look at those people who came up in opposition against you and say, thank you. Because I wouldn't be who I am and where I am today if it was not for you. You played a significant role in my development. And God used you to do that. But I ain't mad at you. I ain't mad at you. That was Joseph's response. Amen. This wisdom and guidance in these short verses that Paul gives us, Colossians, I took you through those scriptures so you can see how the Bible corroborates that. And that you and I should decide that we're going to live for the kingdom of God. And stop getting caught up 
and who hates us and who don't like us and how bad the things are in the world and all that kind of stuff. We know we live in a crooked world. We know we got crooked leaders. So why are you upset when they act like the crooked? They just acting out their nature. Amen. But what you should do and what I should do and we should do collectively is obey God. And again, leave all the consequences to him. You keep getting mad about stuff. You keep getting mad about your president, your Congress and all these other people. Live your life to the fullest for the kingdom of God. Amen. Stop getting caught up in all of that. Amen. Sinful people do sinful things. So stop being shocked. Amen. Stop being shocked. Sinful people do sinful things. Every day, Lord, give me the strength to handle what you're walking me through. And Lord, I'm not asking you to move the mountain. I'm asking you to give me the strength to climb. Because each circumstance or situation is just going to make me stronger. I will never give up and I will never give in. Amen. 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 Give the Lord a hand of praise. Let us pray together, shall we? Eternal God, our Father, we bow before you now, thanking you, O God, for your message today. Thank you, O God, for a mission-driven life. Lord, it is our desire to have a mission-driven life, a purpose-driven life. We're on mission for you, O God. Just like our military has a mission, we have a mission. But our mandate is higher than our military mission because of Our mandate comes from God. Lord, help us, each of us, under the sound of my voice, to be on mission for you. To live a life that's pleasing and acceptable in your sight. To have a life, oh God, that reflects your glory on this earth. And for those of you here today or maybe listen online and you don't know Jesus as your Savior and you want to give your life to him or recommit your life to him, You don't have to leave the same as when you came. And perhaps there's someone who knows the Lord, but just broken in a circumstance or situation you're facing. Whatever it may be, you can turn to Jesus right now and say, Jesus, help me. Lord, strengthen me today. Lord, lift me up today. I'm a little downcast today, but Lord, I heard you loud and clear. Lift up my head, anoint my head with oil, I pray, and lift me up. Strengthen me on every side. Build me up where I'm torn down. Strengthen me where I'm weak, I pray. And Lord, I pray now to receive you as my Savior. Lord, I confess my sins before you right now. And I ask that you forgive me of all my sins, past, present, and future. Right now, I give you my heart and I give you my life. And even I pray just before, Lord, I'm recommitting my life to you because I want to walk with you. I want to live for you. I want to be on mission for you, oh God. My desire is to have a mission-driven life for your glory and for your honor, for your name's sake. Lord, I pray you open the windows of heaven and pour out your blessings upon my life that I may have all the resources I need to do your will. And there's nothing that I'm lacking because I pray you pour out your, your blessing upon me in abundance. But I know, your, Lord, your word tells me to whom much is given, much is required. And I pray to God to use the resource you bless me with to further your kingdom, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. Give me the holy boldness, O oh God, to share my faith with those who don't know you or those who need to reconnect with you, I pray. Lord, I thank you for saving me. From this day forward, O oh God, I am yours and you're mine. I want to walk with you and talk with you. I want to live for you. I want to worship you. I want to serve you. And I want to reflect your glory in this sin sick and dying world in which we live. I give you all the praise, I give you all the honor, and I give you all the glory. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. And all of God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise.
blessings flow. Amen. I hope you've been encouraged today and I hope that you have made up your mind that I'm going to keep Jesus first in my life. I'm going to walk with him. I'm going to talk with him. I'm going to trust him and I'm going to live for him. Amen. If you've been blessed by today's message, please go to our website at agapecommunityfellowship.org. You can go and you can listen to this message and the previous messages in their entirety. So I invite you to go and listen and pass on the link to someone else that you know would love to have grown from this message today. Also, you can also give from our website. And we invite you and encourage you to give. Thank you for your giving and your financial blessings here at Agape. And we encourage God would increase our budget 
and he would bless us and pay off all our debt here to God, that we may do even more for his kingdom, that we may build more uh, facilities on this property so that we can minister to more people for God's kingdom uh, and his name's sake. Amen. We thank God for each of you, and we thank God for your prayers. You continue to pray for us, and we'll continue to pray for you. For those who are listening online, I, I got your family. We miss you, and we love you, and we're still praying for you as well. We thank God for you, each of you. One last announcement. Uh, of course, you know that next weekend is Mother's Day. And so, amen to all our mothers. We thank God for each of you. And so it's something we do here at Agape. We had, we had uh, stopped doing it during the time of the pandemic. Uh, we hadn't done it. But we realized on next weekend, a lot of you all would spend time uh, doing something else. But the following weekend, what the men of Agape want to do for you and for the youth of Agape is we're going to provide your meal. We're going to have a fellowship meal and fellowship hall immediately following morning service. So I hope that you put that in your calendar, that you decide to stick around and break bread with us and and the men are going to, of Agape are going to take care of that meal to provide for you and also serve you. And so that's going to be the following Sunday, which will be, what is it, the 21st? Um, Sunday the 21st, if I'm correct. And so we hope that you join us for that. And so I'll be contacting the men and we will come together and put together a delicious meal. To say thank you to, for our women of Agape, to our mothers, to our wives, for all that you do. Amen. Only a small token of our appreciation because it, we couldn't we couldn't pay you for all that you do. And some of y'all probably say, can y'all try? Can y'all try? <laughs> Let us stand for the benediction. Thank you, God, for each of you. We love you with the love of Christ. Brother Matthew Dixon, our guest today. Thank you, my brother, for being with us today. Uh, you were looking for a church home. You found it. Amen. Amen. God bless you. And you all make sure you all welcome our brother before you depart. May God bless you and keep you. May he always make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. May God bless your life richly. Whatever you're lacking, may God not only add it to your life, but he do so in abundance that you may be a greater blessing to his kingdom here on this earth. And may God watch between me and you as I pray until we meet again. And all of God's people said, Amen, amen, and amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Everybody hug about it.